Thanks so much for worshiping alongside us. You can go ahead and have a seat. Amen. I love that song as it reminds us about the victory that we do have in Jesus. And we're going to continue to celebrate that truth as we uh, take communion together. Speaking on that theme of victory, some of you might know this, that today happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. As a lifelong Chiefs fan, it's going to be a... F- I hope it's going to be a fun day today. And you also may remember that the Chiefs actually did win the Super Bowl last year. And if you're not a sports fan, you may not realize this, but uh, whatever team wins the Super Bowl every single year, every player, coach, member of that organization is rewarded with a Super Bowl ring. Here's a picture of Kansas City's ring from last year. This ring has 10 and a half carats of gemstone. That's 36 genuine rubies and 255 diamonds in in one ring coming in at a cool price of $70,000. But here's the thing that's for me a little bit crazy about these rings. As elaborate, as extravagant, as expensive as those Super Bowl rings are, that ring is actually not the real prize. That's not why they play the game, is to win a ring. That ring, it just represents the true prize. The true prize was winning. It was the victory that they achieved together. You know, in our, in our faith, this time of communion, the bread and the juice, that we celebrate every single week, serves the same purpose as as that ring. We all know there's nothing special about the bread or the juice, just the taste alone of them remind us that there's nothing overly special about it. But what they represent, what they represent is worth far more than what that ring represents. It's a victory that we have in our lives through Christ. But here's the thing about this victory that we celebrate. It's, it's actually not a victory that we won or that we could win. It was a victory that Jesus had to win on our behalf through his death and his resurrection. And although it's not a victory that we can win, it's a victory that can be ours as we place our faith and trust in Christ, as we surrender our lives to his love and his leading. It's those things that we celebrate, that the bread and the juice represent for us. And if you're new with us today, we we invite all of you to participate with us. There's no pressure, but we will share some more uh, uh, instructions on our screens and how we celebrate communion here. Father God, we remember in this moment that Jesus, the incredible links Jesus went to God so that we could experience victory over death, over disease, over fear, over worry, over self-sufficiency. 
God, our lives, all of our lives are in your hands. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
help me know you are
Well, today we begin a brand new series, and let me assure you that this is not going to be your typical sermon series, because we're going to take a look at some different animals, and we're going to learn some lessons from them, which will, which will help us grow in our faith. Now, this concept of learning from animals isn't anything new. If you look in your Bible, you go all the way back to the book of Proverbs in the 30th chapter, verses 24 through 33, it gives a list of animals and their corresponding strengths. And Solomon says, look to the ants for preparation. And he says, look to the rock badgers for protection. And he talks about locusts for teamwork and lions for fearfulness or for fearlessness, lizards for agility. Other translations say dogs to make you feel valued and cats to make you feel unnecessary and inadequate. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, that's, that's just Ashley's Bible. Uh, <laughs> But before we jump in, I, I, I want to test your AQ, all right? Not your IQ, but I want to test your animal quotient. I want to see just how, how smart you are at, at all of our campuses, and I think you'll do well with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a picture of some animals, and you are to shout out, wherever you are, what a group of those animals would be called, all right? So I think you'll I think you'll you'll get it as we go, but uh, this only works if every one of the campuses, if you guys get behind this. All right, so here we go. Here's your first one. What are a group of birds called? Oh, good. You're great. Number two. What are a group of fish called? Mm, good. You are amazing. Number three. What are a group of wolves called? Back. Man, you guys, you all are geniuses. This is amazing. Number four, what are a group of bees called? No. Okay. Swarm. I spoke too soon, you know? They, they stay or they visit or they live in a hive, but they're called a, a swarm. I, I puffed you up. I apologize, all right? Number five, what are a group of lions called? Good. All my people have seen Lion King. Oh, yeah, I know that one, right? Okay, here's the sixth one. I got two left. What are a group of elephants called? The correct answer, a parade. You learn something when you come to church, I'm telling you, all right? Here's your last one. It's the toughest one. What are a group of vultures called? <laughs> it's not a gaggle. Good guess there, but... They are called a committee. I'm, I'm dead serious, they're called a committee. It's no surprise if you enjoy meetings as much as I do, right? But it's true, that's, that's what they go by. You all did pretty well, you did better than I thought you would do. A little later in this message, I'll tell you what a group of rhinos are called. But now you have probably, uh, throughout your life, had pets of some type. The odds are good that you didn't have a, a rhino or a bison or a lamb, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. And each week we're going to focus on different aspects of faith that, that come from these three animals. And this week, I'm excited, I get to talk about having a forward faith, and we're going to learn about the rhino. And I want to challenge you to have a faith that is advancing and a faith that is growing. And the Bible gives us a, a definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 in the first verse. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is that moment of trust when you don't have every question answered and, and every box checked, but you realize that God has given you ample evidence to, to believe. And so you place your trust in him. You say, well, well, Dave, why is, is faith so important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at the sixth verse of Hebrews chapter 11. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So if you want to please the Lord and you are living to do just that, then you will need to have a forward faith. Now, we can look at this in a variety of ways, but here's the, the central premise. A forward faith requires trusting the Lord. That's the sermon in a nutshell. If you want your faith to advance and move forward, you've got to grow in, in trusting him. And whether you know it or not, 
The rhinoceros is a unique animal that affords us some practical parallels with how God wants us to live our lives. And we're going to look at at three of those parallels today that can help to advance our faith. A rhinoceros is not physiologically wired to take steps backwards. He's the only quadruped that struggles to move backwards. It's quite unnatural. It, It only moves forward. So the first parallel is that a forward faith focuses on today and not on yesterday. You might recall on the last weekend of 2020, uh, Ashley and his family were, were sharing a, a, a message and where they kind of interviewed each other. And Ashley talked about the rear view mirror in your car. And he also talked about the windshield that's in your car. And he used this analogy and he said, it's fine to glance at the rear view mirror, but it, it helps us to see what's going on in your past. But your focus should always be on what lies ahead of you. You see, there's a reason that that your rear view mirror is 70 to 80 times less the size of what your windshield is. You see, rhinos, they move forward. And if you focus on what you see in your rear view mirror for too long, you're, you're going to have an accident. And I know plenty of Christians who are consumed with what is behind them rather than what lies before them. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he says, Satan wants you to focus on the the rear view mirror, but we don't want to do that because Satan specializes in, in guilt trips. He specializes in bringing up the past and dredging up our memories and our mistakes so that we are living in the past rather than learning from the past. And the result when he does that is it becomes, in those moments, easier for us to gravitate back to unhealthy routines and habits and fall back into destructive ways. And then Satan uses shame as a method to invite us to repeat those behaviors. Someone said that a rut is a grave with the ends kicked out. And there's a lot of truth to that. So change it up, establish some new habits, positive routines that will feed your faith and advance your trust in the Lord. Take the spotlight off of yourself and place it on others. Serve other people, serve in the church, serve in the community. James writes in James chapter two, verse 26, he says, faith without works is dead. And so what we do is we we try to serve others, not out of obligation, But as a church, we try to do it out of appreciation for what God has done for us. And God wants you to experience a a life that is abundant, to experience a a life that is joyful, a, a life of passion. And the way to do that is by focusing on what's ahead and not fixating on what's behind, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what's ahead. Because a forward faith focuses on today and not yesterday. Rhinos don't retreat, they advance. Well, let me acquaint you a little bit more with with this animal. Rhinos run fast, but they see poorly. Did you know that a rhino can only see about 20 or 30 feet in in front of them? I don't know who the dude was that figured that out, you know. Feel sorry for him if he he thought it was uh, a further distance than what it was, you know. But now when I tell you that and you think about the rhino, you would think that because his eyesight is bad that he would be very cautious and he would be uh, tentative and he would be careful and always scared that he was going to bump into some obstacle. But that's not the way God made him. Uh, I I love this video clip. (laughs) because I, I'm praying for the videographer right now uh, that he doesn't fall in front or that he, the rhino doesn't catch up with him. But God created the rhino with boundless energy. Did you know the fastest man in the world, Usain Bolt from Jamaica, the fastest speed he tops out at is 27 miles per hour. A rhino runs over 30 miles per hour. Is that crazy? So here's our second parallel. I want to make certain that you get this. A forward faith faces fear and runs it over. Remember, the rhino is nearsighted, 
But when he's on the move and when he's on mission, he doesn't have any fear. Did you know that the Bible says one phrase 365 times? It's the phrase, fear not. The most repeated phrase in all of God's word. I think that God wants to make certain that we don't give in to fear. That we have a confidence, that we have a trust, that we have a faith in him. One for every day of the year. God doesn't want you cautiously walking through this life in fear. He wants you advancing with confidence and with courage. And think about it. If you could only see 20 or 30 feet in front of you, but you can run 30 miles per hour and you weigh over 2,200 pounds, you're not going to be slowed down by problems because those problems will quickly be in your past and they will be flattened, right? Think back to earlier uh, when I was asking about what a group of animals are called. You know what a group of, of rhinos are called? A crash. Aptly named, right? For obvious reasons. If something gets in their way, they don't take time to fear it. They certainly don't have time to stop. They just keep moving forward and these powerful, huge animals just mow down whatever is in their path. They just move forward. And God's word is challenging us to move forward in faith. And since the rhino has such poor eyesight, he has to rely more on is hearing. I understand that uh, a rhinoceros has some of the best hearing in all of the animal kingdom. And the same should be true with Christians. What we listen to has the potential to, to help us grow that forward faith. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A forward faith begins with putting yourself in a setting where you can hear God's word being taught, where your faith advances when you, you read God's word and, and you open it up on a regular basis. That's why Ashley and Mark are, are constantly reminding us to be in God's word throughout the week. It's impossible to have a, a growing, forward-moving faith if you aren't hearing and reading and applying God's word. This is your owner's manual. And the one who created this universe and created you wanted to make certain that you would reach your full potential. And the way to do that is by reading this and by applying it and putting it into your life. And so put yourself in situations where you can hear God's word and you can develop healthy habits that will help your faith move forward. The skeptic would dismiss this and, and say, well, you know what? A, a rhino is, is foolish to, to run faster than he can even see. But in a sense, it's actually an expression of a bold faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. That's what we do. And like a rhino, we can only see a couple of steps in front of us, but, but we keep advancing and we keep trusting in the one who is leading us and who is guiding us. We don't know where to go at times. We're not sure what to do. We have a lamp, but God has a spotlight. And he can see all of the steps that he's ordered for, for man and woman. He sees the big picture, the full picture. We see just a portion of it. A forward faith keeps us advancing toward Christ. And even when it doesn't make complete sense to us, even when it goes against what we feel would be right, if we have that forward faith, we can still choose to walk by faith and not by sight. I've seen a lot of people who have the capacity to move forward swiftly, but instead they allow their fears to paralyze them and they become reluctant and they become frightened and they never take a step of faith, even a small one, because there is safety and security in their complacency. And so they don't share their faith and so they don't invite someone to come to church and they allow society to direct their steps rather than the Lord. I love this passage. You know it well. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. A forward faith trusts that God knows what's best for us. So just like those rhinos, we keep on trucking. 
We keep on moving forward. I guess it was about six years ago, I, I had a bike accident and I, I broke two of my ribs. And I'm telling you what, you talk about a painful injury. It, it hurts when you laugh, when you cough, when you sneeze, when you breathe, all right? I mean, it is a painful injury. And after a couple of days of getting absolutely no sleep, I called up my doctor and I said, hey, you got to help me. I need some help here. I said, I'm not getting any sleep. He said, well, are you lying in a bed? I said, well, yeah, that's what you do, right? And he said, oh, no, no, no. The first week he said, you can't, you can't lay down flat in a bed. He said, that's too painful. He said, you have to sleep sitting upright in a chair. I said, that's impossible. I said, no one can sleep sitting upright in a chair. But the next Sunday... I was in the middle of my sermon and I looked out at my congregation. <laughs> it's possible, right? Some of you have marveled at this talent and now you have it, right? But I mean, it was, it was a painful injury. And I think it took eight weeks for me to be able to return to my normal activities. It really slowed me down. But at about week five, Tim Tebow was in town and he was over and my wife hollered in the other room and said, did you tell Tim about your broken ribs? And I said, oh, well, no. I said, I, I didn't want to make a big deal about it. No. And Tim said, you got broken ribs? I said, well, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm in about week five of it. He said, most painful injury I've ever had. And I'm like, come on, brother, sing it louder, right? <laughs> you know, because he's like, his arms are bigger than mine. And I'm serious, they are, okay? And so the fact that he is milking, and he's going on and I'm on, come on, come on. He said, oh, it's terrible, terrible pain. You can't sleep. I know, I know, amen, that's right, that's right, that's right. Finally, I said to him, I said, so when were you able to return to your normal activities? He said, the second half. <laughs> so I kind of worked in reverse at that point, Right? And uh, my wife is the sweetest woman that you'll ever meet. And Beth stuck up for me. She said, well, Dave preached the next week. <laughs> Not quite apples to apples, right? But you caught a glimpse last week of just how competitive and how passionate Tim Tebow can be. And Tim Tebow wants to be in the game. He doesn't want to be sidelined. His is a forward faith and he's bold and he's aggressive and he is not afraid to say anything about Christ in any setting. And even if he is injured, he wants to be in the action because he wants to make a difference. Here's what I'm saying to those of us who claim to be Christians. We are going to have to decide to be a rhino with thick skin. Their skin is about an inch to an inch and a half thick. And I share that with you because as the world grows increasingly hostile toward Christians, you're going to need to develop a thick skin because Christ followers can expect intense scrutiny and opposition in the days and years to come. And so you better buckle up. And you better put on your big boy pants because a Christian isn't going to be a faint of heart Christian. This is going to be something that you're going to have to take a stand. Now, when I say that you're going to have to have thick skin, I'm not talking about you being insensitive. I'm not talking about you being calloused. Not at all. I love the way Oswald Sanders says it. He says, maturity is moving from a thin skin and a hard heart to a thick skin and a soft heart. That's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of a growing, active forward-moving faith. It strengthens you so that you can endure the hits from the opposition and withstand the bruises and the broken bones. A thick skin has served the rhino well and it can serve Christians well. Your faith in Christ may be openly ridiculed in, in the public uh, sector. The media will mock your morals. Now is the time to decide that I'm going to be serious about my Christianity. This is not a time for casual Christianity to play at church. This is no time for wimps. If you want your faith to advance, then your skin is going to have to thicken. And we must be more concerned over disappointing our God than disappointing our social media followers, 
or our friendship circle or our extended family. And if we are to have a forward faith, it will require trusting God and trusting his promises. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he said, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, for years I read that and I pictured this dark culture creeping in and coming at the church and Christians backing up as evil escalated, kind of like what we've seen in, in recent years. And I thought, well, you know what? Jesus is saying, we, we just need to pray. We just need to try our best as a church just to hang on. And somehow the, the church might just survive until Jesus returns and Satan and hell won't prevail. But the more I've studied that passage and what Jesus said, the more I realized that I was looking at the picture in reverse fashion. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus isn't talking about Satan attacking the church. He's talking about the church and Christians storming the gates of hell. A gate is not an offensive weapon. A gate is a defensive weapon. It serves its purpose when you have settled in and enemies are approaching and you try to protect what it is that you have. And with that in mind, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And yet Satan has succeeded in getting the church to think that our job is merely to survive, just to hang on, just to endure. But the picture that Jesus Christ paints is just the opposite. You see, for too long, the church has played defense. It's time for the church to play offense. Jude chapter one, verse 23 says this, snatch others from the fire and save them. We're on the attack, we're on the move, we are taking back what Satan has illegitimately claimed. The church is aggressively advancing like a rhino because we are driven by our love for people. Our love for others is greater than our fear of being ridiculed. It's greater than the awkwardness of having that spiritual conversation with someone. And so we decide today that we won't be discouraged, that we won't be distracted, we won't be deterred because eternity hangs in the balance and lost people matter to God. And you may have allowed Satan to sideline you because of the wounds from the world. But whether you have a broken rib or whether you have thin skin, I'm just telling you, it's the second half. And you need to get back in the action. And you need to be strong. And you need to be courageous. And there's one more rhino characteristic that I want to call attention to. And that's his horn. This is his greatest weapon that he, he leads with. And when he is running 30 miles per hour with this solid, sturdy, strong horn, nothing can stop him. But this is really interesting. This, this horn is not made out of bone. It's not made out of ivory. It's comprised of millions of thin, weightless hairs that are held together by cutin. And the unique thing is that the rhinoceros horn is the most prized and it is the most dangerous in all of the animal kingdom. And yet it serves as a visual reminder for the church and for Christians that alone we are weak but together we are strong. And that's our third parallel. A forward faith flourishes in biblical community. You see, isolation and separation are some of Satan's strongest weapons. And in the last year during the pandemic, it has made it easier for Satan to use those tactics. But I'm telling you, we need one another. We need one another. We need one another as a body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 says that, that we're all important parts of this body. And, and when we all do our part, then God does some pretty incredible things. And when the church is unified, God is glorified. Please don't misunderstand me. The power is not in the numbers. It's not in our interdependence. The power is in our dependence on God. We stand together. We have one another's back. And the reason that some of you don't feel strong right now is because you, you aren't in community. 
You don't have community within this church, and I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to, to get in a CCV group because there, there is power in those relationships. God can do incredible things. Let me tell you, every time I come to CCV, you all pick my spirits up. There's something that this church does for one another. The same thing happens in the groups that you're involved in. And when you get close to others and you see firsthand their trust in the Lord, it serves to propel you forward in your faith and in your trust. So here's my challenge for you. Identify the area where you struggle to move forward with faith. What is that area? Is it, is it in a family issue? Is it in a relationship? Is it with your self-image? Is it with your career? Identify what that area is where you, where you struggle to move forward with faith. And then start praying to God and say, I I'm turning this over to you, Lord. And then turn it over to him each and every day. If you would have asked me that question to identify that area six weeks ago, what area I was struggling with as it relates to trusting in God, I know how I would have answered. I, I, I feared the loss of my dad's dignity as I watched his emotional health declining. You may recall when I was here the last time in October, I, I preached on the, the legacy of a leader and I showed a video of my dad but since then, my, my dad's dementia and his memory loss has accelerated. But let me take you back to about six weeks ago when I was struggling with trusting the Lord while watching my hero and my spiritual mentor, this Christian man, beginning to fade. It had become evident to my brother and me that it was time for my dad to move from his apartment in his retirement community into a memory care unit where he'd have more supervision. And, and dad had at that time, I was beginning to fixate on whatever he had coming up next. And whatever the slightest issue or the slightest change was from his normal routine, he had this tendency just to allow it to dominate his, his thinking. And he would get so worked up because he wanted to make certain he was there and he didn't want to be late. And so the staff and our, our family felt like it was better to have an unexpected meeting with him on a, on a Sunday night and explain the rationale for, for moving him to him and then to move him the very next day to the memory care unit. And that way he wouldn't have a lot of days to be frustrated or to be worried about it. And walking to dad's room on that Sunday night, I asked the staff supervisor along with my brother, I said, hey, how do these conversations normally go? And she said, well, she said, uh, sometimes they're met with a lot of anger and resistance. That's very natural and normal because they feel like their freedom is is being taken. Dad was surprised to see us. We sat down and we soon began systematically and compassionately explaining how we were concerned for his health and his safety. And we recommended that he move to the memory wing. And Dad said, well, I hadn't really thought about that. I really appreciate your concern. Let me think about it for a few weeks. And so we went a layer deeper and we shared specific concerns and examples of his confusion and told him that we felt like such a move needed to take place sooner rather than later. And dad sat there trying to process what my brother and I were saying. And the supervisor spoke up about a, a room that had just come available and, and, and I said, dad, we're staying in a hotel tonight we're, we're here, we can help pack up all of your things and they can move them and you can move into that room tomorrow. And the supervisor said, yes, Mr. Stone, we think this is a really good plan that can help you in your next chapter. And dad kind of smiled, but he didn't say anything. And finally, my brother, Jeff, just lovingly said, dad, we would really like to have your blessing on this. And it was evident to dad in that moment what a yes would mean. It would cost him some independence. It would cost him some freedom. It would decrease his time with his closest friends. And he said, you know, this is moving a lot faster than I would have liked. And, and then he paused. And after some silence with emotion, he said, 
But I know you all love me very much. And I know that you want what's best for me. And so I'll trust your judgment and we can move forward. And so we did. And my dad was ready and willing to take the step of faith, a step he didn't want to take. Partly because of his trust in his sons, but mostly because of his trust in God. Six weeks ago, I would have struggled with the road ahead for dad. That's what I would have said. But the next month after dad moved, our whole family was praying that God would help each of us trust God's plan and trust God's timetable. And then 13 days ago, dad experienced some low blood pressure. They took him to the emergency room to just play it safe and to get him checked out. My brother and dad were having a good conversation in the ER. And like usual, dad was asking about family members and more concerned with them than himself. And then he experienced a cardiac failure, passed away at the age of 84. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And dad cannot return to us, but someday through our trust in Jesus Christ, we can go to him. And while our family misses him terribly, we have great peace. Because for the Christian to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And yet there's not a day that goes by that I don't drift back in my mind to that heavy Sunday night conversation in late December in his old room as I saw and heard my dad continue to trust in God's plan and the suggestions of his sons, as dad said yes to whatever God had planned for him. It makes me wonder if a month later, God rewarded dad for his trust and humility by taking him home to receive his reward. Our God is a gracious God. And dad took that step of faith I'm not just talking about six weeks ago, I'm talking about as a teenager in Clovis, New Mexico, when he initially swallowed his pride and placed his trust in Jesus Christ. And he expressed that he was a sinner in need of God's grace. And he humbled himself and was baptized into Jesus. And if you have never expressed your faith in Christ, then I'm asking you to do those same things. to acknowledge that there is someone who loves you very much. His name is Jesus. And he wants what's best for you. In fact, he came from heaven to earth and died on a cross to pay for your sins. You do know that it's impossible to trust God with your career, to trust him with your relationships or with your family issues if you haven't first entrusted your life to him and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And that's the starting place. And so, I'm asking, will you trust him today? Will you start trusting? Or will you restart trusting him so that you can have a forward journey of faith? Let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, The psalmist said, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. May that phrase describe us. We don't want to put our hope in our material possessions. We don't want to put our hope in our strength. We want our trust to be in you. So will you help our faith move forward by learning to trust you more? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.